Hello, my little creepy crawlies. It's Allison Dixon reporting from your one-stop shop for all things weird and whack. Ding dong darkness time. This ditch episode officially marks the beginning of October, and along with the brisk breezes, warm spices, and turning foliage that mark this month as the best one on the calendar, you can count on this podcast to bring you some shows with a little extra oomph in the frights department. This week, I'm making good on a promise I made way back in my Light as a Feather episode by introducing you to a scary woman who isn't me. She might not hear you when you say her name once or twice because she values persistence. So grab a mirror, kill the lights, and let's get to know a little bit about a lady named Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody... Kids always want to know their futures, like they're these set destinations to which they simply need to arrive. Will I get married? Will I have kids? Will I be rich and famous? When will I die? They love magic eight balls and Ouija boards, horoscopes, and those little origami fortune teller things that fit over their fingers. I don't know about you, but I had a ton of those things littering the bottom of my backpack. And they might just be daring enough to stand in a pitch black bathroom with nothing more than a weak candle or flashlight to provide a spark of security, look in the mirror, and repeatedly call the name of a spirit who may not answer too kindly if she shows up. This is what's purported to happen when you speak the name Bloody Mary. The name could also be Hell Mary, Mary Worth, Mary Wales, and even Black Agnes or Bloody Bones, depending on where you've heard this myth. You say it 13 times into the mirror in a darkened room, usually the bathroom, and the visage of a woman, often bloodied, will appear. After that, the stories vary, but the prevailing theory that she will either stare menacingly at you, scream like a banshee, scratch your eyes out, or yank you through the mirror to live with her. And if you break the mirror to get away from her, you risk releasing her spirit into the world. In all my research on this topic, I saw no reports that Mary did anything useful like give you the winning lottery numbers or makeup tips or helping keep toothpaste spatter to a minimum. But I guess when you're a ghost, you've earned the right to stop being helpful. There's a great deal of debate as to who this Mary lady is really supposed to be, but the most common theories are thus. Some say she might be Queen Mary I, daughter of Henry VIII, who was dubbed Bloody Mary because the devout Catholic monarch liked tossing Protestants on a bonfire whenever the fancy struck her, which was apparently quite often. Look, I'm not saying there were some daddy issues going on here, but since her father was a giant prick who established Protestantism in England, mostly so he could go about getting divorced more easily, provided he didn't have his wives beheaded, I find it darkly amusing that Mary spent the majority of her reign undoing Henry's religious handiwork. And of course, she undid that handiwork by burning as many Protestant believers alive as she could. Of course, then her sister, Elizabeth I, took over, and she made things all Protestant again and spent a great deal of her reign barbecuing Catholics. But the only one given the nickname of Bloody Mary from this whole enterprise of religious terrorism was Mary. But if anything, I think the phrase Bloody Mary is just evocative for marketing purposes because it's two opposing forces, right? You have bloody on one side, which is, of course, associated with death, murder, and ick. And then you have Mary, a name that is constantly associated with the pure, the virginal, the mother of Jesus Christ himself, correct? So you put those two forces together. It's a nice little play on contrast. I can see the appeal. We love to use it for a brutal queen, a scary childhood game, and a delicious morning hangover cure. I have no doubt the first person to link Bloody Mary to an evil mirror witch plucked it out of the popular culture because they sure as hell aren't telling us to stand in front of a mirror and chant Virgin Queen Elizabeth I in the hopes of summoning a woman who was every bit as lethal as her sister, but somehow still received better press. 
Others have speculated that Bloody Mary is famed serial killer from antiquity Elizabeth Bathory, a Hungarian countess who allegedly killed hundreds of servants and, according to the legends anyway, bathed in their blood in order to maintain a youthful appearance. Now, I can totally see how this might spawn a creepy legend about a blood-covered angry woman popping up in a mirror, but why would she respond to the name Mary? Makes no sense. Other origin stories attempt to peg her as the spirit of a hanged witch, because of course that cliche has to exist in anything involving a sort of frightening woman. She's a witch, burn her! It's unclear how far back this particular legend of Bloody Mary goes, but as I dug deeper into the history of people using mirrors for magical or ritualistic purposes, I started to realize it predates the creation of mirrors themselves, at least the ones we think of when we're fretting over our hair, wrinkles, and zits. Those came around the Middle Ages, and only for the very wealthy. Before then, any reflective surface would do. Water? Check. Oil? Absolutely. Polished iron or obsidian? Now we're talking. The practice of divining wisdom from glass and other reflections is called scrying, and it's still in use today among pagan and witch folk, but it was heavily in use throughout the world in ancient times across many cultures, including Egypt, Persia, and Mesoamerican civilizations like the Incans and the Mayans, and it culminated through the Renaissance in Europe until the rise of Christianity eventually outlawed it. Queen Elizabeth I actually relied heavily on her royal alchemist, Dr. John Dee, and his use of a scry mirror. Reflections have long been thought of as portals to other dimensions, and the longer one gazes upon said portals, the more one sees and the more insights one has. The term scry comes from the Old English word descry, which means to reveal. A more modern and way more magicked up take on this that a younger person might be able to relate to comes from Harry Potter, when Harry stared into a special mirror in order to see his parents again, and the bowl of special water that Dumbledore had called a pen sieve that allowed the user to see the thoughts of others. But in practice, the point is really to stare into the reflection and come away with some sort of new wisdom or insight. That is not entirely unlike other meditative practices that involve intense focus. When one shuts out all outside distraction and directs all their mental energies at one thing, which I know sounds like an impossible task in this day and age, one might come away with a whole new set of ideas and inspirations. It's less magic and more about calibrating one's mental potential. We see this practice, say, in Buddhist cultures all across the world. Certain people might find such a thing threatening, however, akin to opening a door to let in something they may not want to wrestle with. A little more on that in a bit, though, because it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. In the early 20th century, there was some literature about women who would close their eyes, do a specific chant, and then glimpse into a mirror. If they did it right, they might see the face of their future husband, or they might also see a skull staring back, in which case they were going to die before meeting their betrothed. Bonus points if they did this while holding a candle and a mirror while walking backward up a set of stairs. Yes, this was actually part of the ritual too, and might be the sole reason why some of these women didn't survive to marriage. Now, I'm going to play a confession card straight off the deck here. When it comes to pagan rituals and various other spiritual encounters, I admit to bringing a heavy trunk full of possible scientific and psychological explanations to the party. And I've done that here today, don't worry. But... While light as a feather might have freaked out my tiny child mind that one time I tried it, you can go back and listen to that episode for the whole story if you're curious. Once I learned the actual physics behind it, I was ready to jump right in to help pick someone up with my middle and index fingers. But this whole summoning a mirror witch thing, yeah... No thanks. In fact, when considering the actual science behind why Bloody Mary and other mirror-related rituals have an effect on people, I'm even more inclined to avoid it. I've known about the Bloody Mary legend my whole life. I've even been on the receiving end of plenty of dares and gone so far as to walk into the bathroom and turn off the light. 
only to quickly flip it back on again, too scared to even try it once because I felt the press of darkness and cold all around me. I don't even want to do it now. And it isn't because I'm afraid of the dark because I'm not. It's because there are certain mind games that aren't worth playing. And that's even more so now that I'm far removed from the age bracket that finds this stuff most appealing. In psychology, the ages between 9 and 12 seem to be when most of these games are played. It's that fleeting pocket of time between early childhood and puberty when you can sense the mountain of encroaching adult life in front of you and you want to both squeeze as much fun as you can out of what's left of your childhood and also do something to massage your anxieties over your increasing awareness of the world around you. You're aware of the darkness out there, but still innocent enough to want to play with it. In a primal way, it's a little like playing with books of matches. You know that fire burns, that it can destroy things. However, the matches smell good and the flames are so tiny. What's the harm? You probably think I'm about to go all satanic panic on you, and trust me, I'm not. It isn't spirits, ghosts, and demons that frighten me. It's other people, equipped with minds we only barely understand, even in this highly modernized scientific age. Staring for a period of time into a dimly lit, reflective surface can actually cause one to hallucinate because the visual processing and facial recognition centers of the brain begin to misfire, causing any face we do see in that reflection to melt, swirl, or distort in other ways. This is called the dissociative identity effect. There are other possible optical illusions at play here too, such as Troxler's fading, where fixating on a single point can cause other visual points to fade from view. You can even put yourself into a hypnotic state or fall into a cognitive pitfall called apophenia, which is when we assign significance between two things that are actually unrelated. There are several types of apophenia, one of which is called pareidolia, the tendency to see faces in inanimate objects like the moon, for instance, or Jesus in a piece of toast. Gamblers are actually guilty of apophenia to an almost pathological degree, attributing their successes to an ability to see patterns in the numbers. By playing games like this with your mind, if you're unprepared for what could happen, you could wind up trapped in a bit of an ugly mental vortex of your brain's own making just by virtue of the way it chooses to process sensory input. At the very least, it can increase your anxiety levels, which can cascade into other areas of your life. This isn't to say I don't think we shouldn't enjoy little opportunities to scare ourselves. Personally, I plan to watch a glut of horror movies this month and take a trip to a few local haunted attractions. It's all about measuring your expectations and taking them for the novelties they are. If you go into the bathroom to summon Bloody Mary or some other toilet spirit, more on that in a minute. Just do so with the full awareness that your brain and eyes will likely be playing tricks on you and that it doesn't have anything to do with an angry ghost woman, but everything to do with your neurons having no clue how to fire in the absence of the information they need. And this goes without saying, but if you're doing this while already in an altered state, say with, you know, weed or alcohol or whatever, then you're really asking for trouble. Our brains are complex organic computers and so many of the things we subject it to can make it function like we just loaded an old GeoCities website with the music player, flashing graphics, and cascading animated hearts hitting all at once. Now, before I talk to you a little bit about the ghosts in the toilet, I want to give a shout out to my lovely friend, author Hilary Monahan, who's actually written a lot of novels, but in particular, two young adult ones about Bloody Mary that you should totally check out, Mary the Summoning and Mary Unleashed, both of which can be now had as a single volume called The Bloody Mary Saga. Hillary is a fantastic writer and a dark goddess of such power I can only aspire toward. And when I asked her if I could give her a hat tip here, she mentioned the existence of other similar quote unquote toilet bogeys and how cultures all over the world have something like this, which I found fascinating. And the legends seem to be particularly plentiful over in Japan. 
The spirit of a young girl named Hanako-san is the most popular and believed to populate school bathrooms. Hanako-san's backstory varies. She could either be a student who died while playing hide-and-seek during an air raid in World War II, or a bullied student who took her own life. Some stories say she was simply murdered by a caretaker. She's usually described as having a short bobbed haircut and wearing a red dress. To summon her, one needs to go to the third floor of a school building, enter the room, and knock on the door of the third stall, asking if Hanako-san is there. If she answers in the affirmative, then it's likely she will open the door, grab you, and pull you down the toilet, which may very well lead to hell. Hanako-san isn't the only bathroom ghost to terrorize Japan. Pull up Atlas Obscura and you can find a whole list of different spirits that inhabit this unique room there. The Akaname is a little goblin that licks up filth with its long tongue. Kashima Reiko is a legless ghost in search of her legs, which were, according to legend, severed by a train. But one of the creepiest ones I read about was for a change, not a scary girl. His name is Aka Manto, who is this very handsome spirit in a red cape that has a hood on it and a mask that just keeps him hidden. And he appears to people in public restrooms, usually in the last stall, as they're going to wipe. You'll hear a question from the other side of the door that asks if you would like a red cape or a blue cape, or if you want red paper or blue paper. Choosing red will lead to a very gruesome and bloody death, usually by having your back sliced open down the middle. If you answer blue cape, your death will come in the form of suffocation. And the only way to get this spirit to go away is if you politely refuse the offer of paper. So if you're in Japan, stay out of the last stall. I think that's really your best line of defense here. It's funny how so much of what I've talked about revolves around the bathroom, isn't it? Well, it makes sense when you think about it. A bathroom is an odd liminal space in the home or building. You go in there, do your private business. They're a sanctuary of sorts. There's water. Usually there's a mirror. And there's also entry and egress points in the form of dark, twisty pipes that run for miles and miles beyond our safe space and lead to those terrifying subterranean warrens of rats and excrement known as sewers, where scary clowns and alligators also reign supreme. In the bathroom, you're not only alone, but you're vulnerable, naked, or at least partially so, and you still believe on a very deep lizard brain level that something could jump out from a nearby bush and end you right where you squat. Without even thinking, I can name off the top of my head three legendary horror movies involving terrifying bathroom scenes. Psycho, A Nightmare on Elm Street, The Shining. I know you're already thinking of several more, and one of them better involve a clown in the bottom of a bathtub drain. In other words, it's the perfect place for a ghost to turn up, and I myself feel this energy every time I'm in one. Not necessarily ghost energy, but this feeling that I'm in a vulnerable space and I want to do what I need to do and get out. Self-induced hypnosis and hallucinations from summoning mirror witches is not part of that routine, but you do you. And if you do, or if you have played Bloody Mary or stared into a scry mirror and saw your future unfold in front of you, I would love to talk to you about that. Shoot me an email at ddarknesstime at gmail.com or reach out to me on Twitter at ddarknesstime or just drop your feelings in a review. I love hearing from you over on iTunes. It really helps grow the show. This month is going to bring some fun surprises and even more creepy stories in keeping with the Halloween spirit. I recently asked for some ideas for October spooky ditch episodes, and I received so many good leads that I have decided to push the premiere of season three to the end of the month. Worry not though, those episodes are currently being written and recorded, and we will commune on cults starting in November. It'll be here before you know it. I hope you enjoyed this one, folks. Come back and see me for another one next week. But in the meantime, be good, you little ding-dongs.